Okay, welcome everybody to the Clivar workshop on the pattern effect. I'm uh, Christy Proistosescu. Uh, nobody can pronounce my last name. My students call me Professor Christy. Uh, this is Maria Rugenstein. Uh, we're co-chairing this, so we're going to be the ones running around like a headless chicken. Uh, thanks everybody for coming. Thanks Clivar for hosting us. Uh, we're really excited about this workshop. Uh, thanks for our sponsors, uh, DOE, RGMA, NOAA, MAP, and CDP, and NSF uh, Climate and Logical Dynamics. Uh, due to their support, we've been able to put together one of the largest Clivar workshops. Uh, we got a total of 135 uh, participants, 70% uh, in, 70 in person, 65% uh, uh, virtual. So, um, yeah, we should have a great in-person participation, and we're also going to have great virtual discussions. And the clicker stopped working. Can we advance? Okay, so why are we here? We're here because we're interested in the pattern effect, right? The pattern effect describes the impact of time evolving sea surface temperature patterns on radiative feedbacks and climate sensitivity. It's mediated by ocean atmospheric circulation. So it's a fairly broad topic uh, and we've gathered people that have been working on this or have, uh, we think have insight on this or have interest in this problem. Uh, can we advance? Uh, and what are the goals of the workshop? We want to bring together different communities that have interest and insight into the pattern effect. Uh, we want to synthesize and syncretize the existing knowledge of the pattern effect. This is going to be the focus of the first uh, one and a half days, getting everybody on the same page, uh, making sure we have an understanding of how the different pieces work together. And then the last two days are going to be very much focused on forward looking discussion. How do we move the field forward? Where do we go from here? Um, that different communities was bolded for a reason. So this is the breakdown of career stage. We got 31% students, 40% early career. So within seven years of PhD, that 71% are students and early career scientists, which means we're all here to learn. So we want this to be a very open, uh, very open um, workshop. And if you look at the areas that people work in, there's sure there's a sort of traditional CF MIP community that has been working on this before, but we got people working on generic atmosphere and climate dynamics, physical oceanographers, paleo climate, remote sensing experts, uh, climate modelers, and so on. Advance. Other way. Okay. So when we think about the philosophy of the workshop, right, there's the part where we want to synthesize. And because of the breadth, we really want the speakers and people making comments and in the panel to keep the broad audience in mind. It's a very broad audience. It's very important. We bring everybody together. So you know, be patient. Uh, and for everybody, ask a lot of questions, ask a lot of clarification questions, a lot of follow up questions. We'll try to set an example of asking really dumb questions and we hope everybody follows suit. Remember, 70% are students in early career and we really just want to make sure that everybody feels like they've learned something from everybody else. Uh, similarly, when we're moving into the advancing the field, be creative. Nobody knows the right answer. We're trying to figure out what, how to do this moving forward. Uh, be respectful of other people's perspectives as they come from other fields, might have other interests, and in general, be respectful of everybody's, um, of everybody else. I think this is where I hand it over to you. Sure. Okay. Okay, you find the agenda online, and I will walk you quickly through the agenda to explain a little bit our philosophy to explain a little bit our philosophy of, of the, how we set together the, um, the workshop. So there will be the first one and a half days will be review talks only. We try to get everybody on, let's say, maybe not the same page, but a similar page. Um, we will have poster sessions, uh, three in person, um, and we have lightning talks uh, from the online folks. 
We have panel discussions, breakout discussions, uh, and a little greens function model intercomparison overview at the, on the on Friday. This is just slow. Okay, so we will start off with the review talks. They will be short, not talking about the science of the speaker, but reviewing the science um, around different subjects. Uh, we will have Q and A right after the talk, and we will have more Q and A. Uh, uh, um, an hour later or so. If you are in person, go up to the mic, introduce your name and your affiliation because there's uh, uh, a cameras focusing on the mic so the people online can see you. And it really uh, uh, tighten your question, short question, and say who you are so the online folks can also follow. If you are online, just raise your hand, then we can unmute you uh, or just type in the chat and we can pull up the chat. The poster sessions will be a little bit complicated. Um, <clears throat> there is an online poster gallery, which hopefully everybody uploaded their poster. If not, do it now. Uh, the link should be also in the Slack if you lost the email. Everybody has access to this online gallery, and that's the extent to which we are hybrid. So we, if we have poster sessions in person here, they will be in person only. For the online folks, there will be three lightning talk sessions. So we and them, uh, th them learn about everybody's research in just like three minute lightning talks. For the in-person people, they won't have lightning talks because we will have so great poster sessions here. They are, there are themes for the poster sessions um, and you should have gotten a color. So we will have a theme today on the science of today one tomorrow and then on Thursday it's just open because we will have more to talk anyways. We encourage, highly encourage both the people online and in person to look at the poster gallery and then reach out individually. This is a little complicated but it's easier than f f making all the time zone adjustments. So if you see a poster, reach out to that person and just uh, um, uh, uh, find a time suitable for both of you. The online folks could do this within the sessions when we meet here uh, in person, just to keep it simple, but it's up to everybody to, to find the match. We will des uh, describe the panel and the breakouts tomorrow. There will be three and they will all follow each other. There will be a panel and then the breakout will follow the, the discussion of that panel. And then on Friday, there's one and a half hour, we changed this a little bit in the schedule, um, on uh, just discussing one particular uh, application. That's it for the agenda. We have a Slack channel, type questions in. This is a nice way to interact also with the online folks. You can also go up to the mic and talk to the online people in the breaks. Um, and you have the, the hashtags if you, if you wanna Twitter or whatever, but you can also be here <laughs> in the room. If you have questions, ask Jenny. Could you raise your hand? Everybody probably knows Jenny. And Sam, who is table. Okay, uh, or Christy, or me. Thank you. So I will keep talking uh, and explain the scientific rationale behind this workshop. So uh, the, the, the over, uh, I want to share Christy and uh, my motivation to put this up in the first place. And I hope you disagree and agree somewhat. It's just a try to kind of order the discussion around this uh, very uh, diverse uh, and fluffy subject. Um, so this is with input from Christy, Karl Armer, Yui Dong, Chris Kanauskas, and Norman Loeb. So this is not per just only my uh, point of view. So let's try to define the pattern effect. Let's start with historically observed warming, or in this case, it's actually a model. It's a random ensemble member of a random model on the left. Uh, and uh, on the right, you see a warming after a couple of decades after very strongly forced stimulation. So this is for sure uh, a force response, uh, much warmer. And then we have the corresponding top of the atmosphere radiative imbalance uh, of these two cases. Next slide, please. This is kind of annoying because there will be a lot of slides. Uh, so we have radiative feedbacks, um, 
roughly defined as a change in the radiative response for a certain temperature change. So the radiative response is the radiative imbalance minus the forcing. So if we account for this, for these two cases, we get two different feedbacks, minus 2.5 watts per square meter per Kelvin for the left and minus 1.2 uh, on the right. So that's in a nutshell, great, this works. In a nutshell, the pattern effect, the feedbacks are not constant and change through time. This could be in principle due to the temperature range we are calculating our feedback over, right? Like feedbacks might be temperature dependent, but for now and for small temperature changes, which is open, what is small, we can assume this effect to be uh, very uh, small. And what people found over the last decade, let's say, is that the pattern of the temperature, surface temperature, sets the radiative feedback. So what, what do I mean with pattern? And you will see a lot of these um, pattern maps in the next few days. The upper, uh, uh, most two uh, uh, maps are now a pattern the, and the colors range from uh, zero to two. Blue doesn't mean cooling, but it means that this area wants less than the global average and red is more than the global average. And by construction, the average of these is one. So we are thinking a lot in terms of pattern and not in terms of actual temperature anomalies. So these pattern, patterns differ enough that they influence the radiative feedbacks enough that they are in the global mean different. So we can rewrite this a little bit, the feedbacks as the, the irradiative imbalance minus the, the forcing divided by the um, surface temperature, or you have probably seen this, this way of the equation in your climate intro class. And this is just a quick recap how you can depict this. You can uh, show a change of the real world or any climate model. In this case, it's a step forcing simulation of, of several models as a um, function of a change in the radiative imbalance against the surface temperature anomaly. And then you have the intersect being the forcing F term. And then this is all, we, we, we won't talk so much about the forcing a little bit, um, but the slope of this is the feedback. And if you squint, it, you see that they're actually not constant. So the blue line would show you the, the slope for the first uh, 20 years of this particular simulation and the red one, the later slope. Sorry, I'm waiting for this to catch up. Here we go. Um, <clears throat> so you see again a pattern of the first 20 years, which would give you, result you in uh, this sort of uh, feedback. The final number of years give you a, a shallower slope and you see that the difference you, might be subtle, might be really obvious in some regions, causes you to, for this feedback to, to, uh, to change. And one important implication is that the climate sensitivity, which is the estimate kind of extrapolation to the equilibrium, differs more than a degree for these two cases. So this is one big motivation to study the pattern effect, to understand, to try to narrow down uh, climate sensitivity. And even if you do not care so much about the actual real distant future of this will never happen here, um, this matters a lot for estimating climate sensitivity from the historical period. So we are back in this sort of historical warming now. I think this was uh, Marvel 2018 was one of the first papers showing this that if you take a climate model simulation and force it with observed sea surface temperatures, this would be the AMIP run, the, the red one here, you get um, climate sensitivity estimates, the different bars here are different models, of around 1.5, let's say. If you run the same models, but uh, take away the boundary forcing of the uh, SSTs, but let the model run free, you get the purple line here and you get a climate sensitivity of something above two. And then you do not uh, simulate the historical, but this uh, kind of very idealized case. And then you jump up to two, three, four. Uh, and this is even CMAP5. So this is all much worse than CMAP6. Um, um, and the idea is that the reason for this discrepancy is the different SST patterns. So this is one big motivation for studying the, S the, the pattern effect. But even if you do not care about ECS whatsoever, you might care about uh, projections of the next few decades. Um, so let's look 
let's try to think about near-term projections. And as a step to, towards that, let's think about this uh, feedback parameter as uh, not just one number for a pattern, but changing in time. So this is the same now here, feedback parameter, what's per square meter per Kelvin, as we saw here, but we, re we resolve this in time, and this is a 30 year running uh, regression. And these are different climate models, so they all wiggle around, but they all agree at getting more negative recently. More negative means a more stable climate, uh, a colder climate. Compared to these dashed lines uh, uh, are from simulations like this, where the climate model is very strongly forced. So even if you do not care about ECS in the future, we should be able to explain this discrepancy. And we might be interested in thinking about um, bringing these two perspectives together, because this is kind of where we are. And the force simulations do kind of the opposite. So we have here the feedback parameter again th through time. This is uh, logarithmic now. These are different climate models, and they all start off being more stable and move towards being less stable. So we have to explain how do we move from where we are here to here. And it's a, a big question. Can we use the information here to say anything about uh, the equilibrium or is it hopeless? <laughs> is the connection so hard? So this is a bit slow. Here we go. We do have good observations. They are short, but might bridge this. So within our short observations, the question is how much is internal variability? How much of this state we are here is internal variability? How much is forced? How do we make this move if we trust the climate models to the uh, um, uh, very much strongly forced response? So what I will do now is trying to organize the literature on this. And it's a lot, and they are, most of these papers are very recent, and I try to just group them a little bit. So what I will be doing uh, first now is going very slowly through the first three papers on the subject which kind of really laid the foundation for the discussion and then walk, th not walk through all these papers, but kind of uh, try to make sense um, how they uh, fit together. So let's start with Murphy. Um, 1995, this was his third paper in a year. So if you feel unproductive and want to feel worse, read his papers, they are all pretty good. <laughs> And all single author, like this is pretty amazing. So he was the one terming the, uh, uh, the term uh, effective climate sensitivity. So he had his model, Hadley something, very long ago. Uh, and in this model, he, I think the forcing was 1% uh, per year uh, increase. And he observed a diagnose that the effect of climate sensitivity, and he was the first one coining this, changes through time. This is time, this is land, this is sea, the, the red one I highlighted is global mean, and it increases from one or so to two and a half, so that's substantial. And he already concluded that a constant feedback is probably not what is really correct, even though people assumed it for decades. Um, an effective climate sensitivity is the response to a doubling of CO2 at the equilibrium in the assumption that this feedback is constant. So it's, it's an effective, it's not the actual uh, climate sensitivity. Um, he traced it back to the sea ice response, definitely to the short wave and predominantly the sea ice response. Interestingly, in his model, the sea ice in, uh, increased initially and then decreased. So this is uh, a lot of this uh, explanation here. But he didn't, re uh, this was very diagnostic. He didn't uh, do, the understanding was weak. So a couple of years later from actually the same group, um, the next paper came out, Senior and Mitchell um, on a similar model. And they were the first one starting to put some physics in. And their explanation for this changing effect of climate sensitivity was that the Southern Ocean lags, uh, the Southern Hemisphere lags warming because the Southern Ocean is slower and taking up heat, uh, is, has such a great heat capacity that uh, it slows down the warming of the Southern Hemisphere. So I try to sketch this out here. The Southern Ocean stays cold. The, the surface warming, the surface warms, but 
less strongly than the rest of the world. And the free tropospheric temperature is set by uh, uh, tropical temperatures. So this leads to a reduced lapse rate in uh, above the Southern Ocean in the uh, um, mid latitudes, mid and high latitudes of the Southern Hemisphere. This leads to a stronger reduction of deep convective clouds in the Southern Hemisphere compared to the rest of the world and leads to a less reduction of uh, shallow clouds because of the stronger inversion and uh, more easy, more, uh, the moisture would be trapped more easily in this uh, um, stronger atmospheric boundary layer inversion. And then with time towards the equilibrium, the Southern Ocean warms up and the lapse rate relative reduction of the lapse rate decreases and your cloud response flips to a less reduction of deep convection in the southern hemisphere compared to the rest of the world and a stronger reduction uh, of the low level clouds. So they brought for the first time together ocean heat uptake influencing SSTs, influencing atmospheric condition, influencing clouds, influencing radiation. In a sense, this is where we are still at. So now the third groundbreaking early paper I want to go through is Winton, uh, Takashi and Helps in 2010. So this is a similar uh, framework I showed you before. Radiative imbalance, surface temperature response. Um, and uh, they introduced this concept of ocean heat uptake efficacy. This is not efficiency. This is not how efficient is the ocean at taking up heat, but efficacy is how able is the ocean to force radiative feedbacks? So um, they termed this epsilon. And the idea is that if you directly connect your forcing to your equilibrium, this efficacy is one. And this would uh, assume that the uh, radiative feedbacks, the slopes uh, is constant. However, most climate models at least do something like this. So the efficacy is actually larger than one, and they never act out this, uh, this uh, feedback strength. So in this really amazing paper, actually, if I feel like all the ingredients we are talking about now are laid out in there. The ocean heat uptake influences feedbacks through changing SSTs. <clears throat> this efficacy term is actually not constant, it's often also assumed to be constant, but it's uh, also changing in time. The cloud feedbacks make up the largest chunk of these feedback changes, but not 100%. There's still room for others. The efficacy, ocean heat uptake efficacy, and climate sensitivity are actually uh, unrelated, assemble different properties of uh, climate models. And very important, the historic, what we observe in the historical does not necessarily help us to predict the future because of this. Um, so, from there, the discussion kind of, in, in our view, diverged into people see, uh, studying this from an ocean heat uptake perspective. These would be the blue ones versus atmospheric folks who took the SST as a lower boundary condition without worrying where the SST came from and studying what does the atmosphere do? How does it, what are the processes acting out this, this effect? Um, there is a seeming conundrum in these two perspectives, namely, and UA will, will go through the, the, both the mechanisms and the technicalities of this, so this is a little rushed uh, for now, but um, this is kind of, you can think of this as a sensitivity map. If you perturb or if you increase the surface temperatures here versus here, the global mean response, this is what's shown, to a local perturbation, is larger or smaller. So this, these maps are not patterns like this, but tell you for the same perturbation at the lower boundary, what, how do the radiative feedback act uh, to set the new global mean temperature? So this place is more efficient, in, uh, it's, it's more sensitive uh, than this place. So this is the um, atmospheric perspectives of fixing the SST, so the unit here is uh, is unitless, but it's Kelvin per Kelvin. While the ocean perspective comes more naturally from the, from the processes as a heat uptake perspective. So you do the same thing, take a model, perturb the fluxes in uh, just very locally, let the model run to equilibrium, 
if you take out one petawatt here, your global mean response, this is again Kelvin, your global mean response will be much higher double than if you take out the exact same amount of energy here. So these give you these two perspectives where you feel like from the ocean perspective, it must be all high latitudes. And from the atmospheric perspective, it's all the West Pacific warm pole. They do not actually contradict. And we will discuss this. There is very, very few papers, I would say less than a handful, trying to bring these two perspectives together. And this is one big motivation of this workshop. Five minutes, Maria. Thank you. So there's the separate discussion, which is actually not starting to be linked to the pattern effect on SST pattern formation, right? Because many more people are interested in this than people thinking about radiative feedbacks. So which processes set the pace and magnitude of the actual warming in the different regions? Tropical, extra tropical connection as its own subfield, uh, but very much uh, related to this. How much of the force response is observable and just uh, the, the, the observed record we have? Um, should, could, do the models actually simulate the observed pattern? Do we expect them to do so? Uh, how special are the last few decades just in terms of SST patterns, right? So I didn't even list these papers, but this is also one goal to, to make the connection between these two um, discussions. So the mechan uh, UA will give a whole talk about the mechanisms. This is the next talk up. Uh, so I think I will just skip this. Um, most, uh, a lot of, of the papers focus on exactly which feedbacks in the atmosphere act how in order to be uh, uh, non-constant. So uh, again, almost a separate discussion is the estimation of the climate sensitivity. Um, and there's uh, a lot of attempts to come up with new methods. Uh, once we, we agree that oh, we agree that th there is kind of this uh, uh, curvature here, then how do we treat the model's best averaging different ensembles through time, cutting away years in order to predict this truth here at the end? Because some people do care about climate sensitivity, notably, this already as an issue has been mentioned in the Gregory 20, 2004 paper uh, who, who introduced this whole method of linearity um, uh, as a means to, to estimate climate sensitivity. The different the, uh, 10 or so different methods use different assumptions of uh, how the feedbacks change. And this actually influences the magnitude of the, the estimated, estimated equilibrium. Also related, it's kind of an interesting side note that at the time of AR5, 2013, 14, actually these papers were out already showing across models that this is a thing, that the efficacy is larger than one and like 80% of the models or so. However, at this time, 2013, the people writing AR5, still use the assumption that feedbacks are constant um, and you came up with this uh, conundrum that the historical uh, observations result in much lower ECS. And actually, instead of resolving this through this known physics of the pattern effect, the decision was in AR5 to, here we go, to reduce the, the, the overall assessment um, of climate sensitivity down 0.5 degrees. So in a sense, we could have known, but it was too early, uh, too immature to in include it in the report. Um, again, related to all of this is the separate discussion on feedback temperature dependence. And feedback temperature dependence is very hard to separate from, uh, um, technically, uh, uh, from the pattern effect. And this is only a starting discussion now, and I only want to highlight this one uh, figure from a paper by Jonah Bloch-Johnson, who is also here, showing the difference of uh, the co very common method of taking a, a quadrupling step forcing of CO2, dividing it by two to get the ECS estimate of doubling of CO2 above pre-industrial levels. And just squint at the black bars is the degree to which this is not a good assumption due to temperature dependent 
eat bags. It's, it's the strongest contribution. So this, this whole assumption, which is still used in AR6, uh, can get you a wrong ECS of more than uh, 0.5. Notably, this is really relevant for uh, warm models. <laughs> um, this would reflect, might reflect actually, especially strongly in warm models, which appear very warm and they erupt four times, but actually are not so warm in the uh, uh, quadrupling case. I think we, we will have discussions on this. Um, there are papers studying internal uh, variability and how to relate this to the force response. Um, and <clears throat> people increasingly now try to actually quantify this, this effect and give it a number. And the most common method until now is calling a, a pattern effect the difference between some sort of long-term thing, feedback, and let's say a, a, a period of interest, let's say the historical over the last 30 years or the entire historical. So um, AR6 or Sherwood, uh, order of magnitude is 0.5 plus minus 0.5. So it might be not relevant at all. It might be more relevant than a single of our standard feedbacks we are discussing all the time. I would like to bring up as a discussion to whether this is actually a good reference state here, because this is also kind of pretty random in time, or, wh or whether we should uh, relate everything, call everything a pattern effect, which is not homogeneous warming. Okay, let's walk through some open questions along all these uh, lines I try to make. What is the relevant of local versus non-local radiative feedbacks? How is this pattern effect detectable in the very short observed record we have? Can we somehow get a longer record through going back in time? How much of the record we have is forced versus unforced? How do we move from this variability, uh, um, um, from the time where we have for sure quite some internal variability to the forced response of the models? What's the pace of how these uh, patterns emerge? Do we actually trust the models in these patterns? Uh, and how, how do the patterns link to the equilibrium patterns and the different lines of evidence for uh, estimating climate sensitivity? Yeah, do we trust the models in the magnitude and in the pace of the force patterns? Uh, and how do we get there? Um, for the force patterns, what's the, what does actually set the patterns? Where is the ocean uh, at play? How relevant are the extratropics to setting the uh, equatorial Pacific um, patterns, where is the thinking in terms of ocean heat uptake more natural and meaningful versus the thinking of taking SST patterns as a, as a boundary condition, more thinking about uh, the atmospheric processes, magnitude and pace of the ocean warming, how is the ocean heat uptake related to the SST pattern setting, do we still use the right frameworks, can we tweak the frameworks or do we have to come up with a very new one? Temperature, uh, time dependent uh, efficacy or ocean heat um, uptake efficiency or feedback terms. We'll have a whole talk on this. Are the models capable of capturing the observed warming or not? Um, how much is this dependent on which observational product we use? Um, how able are we to separate the force response and internal variability of the SST pattern and the TOA pattern in the observations? Is there room for land warming? We only talk about SST so far. Um, how relevant are, is the aerosol forcing in setting the SSTs? So uh, there's a lot to discuss, I would say. And this is just the start. So I hope you disagree with some of this. I hope you agree with, uh, with other parts. And we go from here. Thank you, Maria. So I know there has been a little bit of conversation online um, between peers and horses. So uh, Pierce just said, at the time of AR5, there were all model studies, um, I think, where over the historical period, the pattern effect EFF ECS change was minimum, I think. And then a follow-up from Thorsten Maritzen said, I think AR5 did not did right to not pick up this idea um, that early. Just because a few models do something doesn't mean it is real. Where is it? In her throat. Thanks. Do we have any questions for Maria? It's not universal. Some 
kind of spent the other way around and CS feedback would get you the opposite curvature. Um, diagnostic, what happens in these models is it's mostly short wave cloud blood rate, which make it more positive through time, which is related also to the feedback temperature dependence. So it, this is, could be in part water vapor temperature dependent feedback, but it is also to large degree short wave clouds, which happen to become more positive. But it's not by physical necessity that they have to. Okay, well, let, let, let me submit one, one suggestion. The, the, the land temperature is gonna come into equilibrium much quicker, and it's also gonna have a lower overall climate sensitivity. Uh, it, it's gonna be a more rapid, it's, in general, we see a lower climate sensitivity for the land processes. Do you think that the land ocean contrast uh, in terms of warming and pace of warming could be playing out there as an important factor as well? Totally could be, yes. And there is a bias in the literature of only looking at uh, as over the ocean SSTs, but uh, you can diagnose this in principle, yeah. Mm -hmm. right. We have one question online and then we'll take that and then we'll move on to the next speaker. So from Diego Jimenez de la Cuesta, don't you think that, uh, sorry, don't you think that the temperature dependence is that with high forcing the wind, wind in efficacy changes May. So, okay, I was a bit a little quick. There is not only feedback temperature dependence, but the forcing is also this forcing CO2 dependence, and um, they all play together and they are hard to separate. And yes, with different forcing levels, you can get different efficacies, but you don't have to. Okay, let's dive a little bit more into the actual mechanisms. So our next speaker is Yue Dong from Columbia University. She will be talking about radiative, radiative mechanisms creating the pattern effect. Uh, yeah, hello everyone. I'm Yue, uh, currently a new postdoc at Columbia University. Before I start, I want to first say uh, we have great artwork advertising the pattern effect workshop here in the flyer by Dave Bonan. Very creative artwork. Thanks, Dave. Uh, but if you can allow me to add something to it, I would add this uh, another dimension of latitude. So you can imagine yourself sitting on the Southern Ocean or high latitude and viewing this uh, tropical Pacific remotely because for the rest of the talk, I will be focusing on the uh, dependence of radiative feedback on both tropical SSTs and trop uh, tropical Pacific SSTs and extropical tropical ocean heat uptick. Uh, yeah, so uh, first a quick uh, recap after uh, following up Maria's talk. Uh, this is a, a comparison of a different ECS estimates. Uh, these are histograms of uh, ECS values from semi-5 and semi-6 fully coupled abrupt full-time CO2 simulation through the standard 150-year regression. But, uh, okay, some work here. If you account for this weakening in the radio feedback uh, strength, then you should expect a higher, well, in general, across models, and then there's a, a higher range of climate sensitivity values as, as shown in this pink bars. Oh, I can see from here, actually. Uh, on the other hand, if you take out the atmospheric components of the model and force them with observed historical SSC surface temperature and CS concentrations, you get even lower range of climate sensitivities. So that means, uh, so you, now I hope I convince you that even for the same model, if the atmospheric model is seeing different SSD patterns, for example, this observed histor long-term historical SD trend pattern on the left, which is relatively uniform with slightly enhanced warming in the West Pacific and the East, uh, versus this uh, model projected long-term equilibrium SST pattern, which with enhanced warming in the Eastern Pacific and part of the Southern Ocean, you will get different range of climate sensitivity. And of course, some of you may wonder that within fully coupled worlds, especially like comparing the blue bars and the pink bars, uh, what is changing with time should not only be SSTs, but also the ocean heat uptake. So on the left, I'm showing this same uh, trend pattern across semi uh, multi-model mean for semi-5 over the whole 150 years. You can see this is a unique pattern for ocean heat uptake, which highlighting the high latitude on longer time scales. 
So I guess my, my mission here, or uh, the focus of my talk is to uh, talk the mechanism, atmospheric mechanism of the pattern effect, specifically what regions and what part of the feed, what regions of a surface warming and what part of the feedback process is most responsible for this pattern effect. But because of this different patterns of different quantities, so I wanna address this question by summarizing the recent progress in our community from these two perspectives. One is to look at the uh, dependence of radio feedbacks on surface heat flux, so the ocean heat uptake pattern effect, and the other focus on the dependence of the feedbacks on seas of the temperature. I'm sorry, I feel bad here, I, I put surface temperature, but actually I will be focusing on seas of the temperature, the SST pattern effect. Uh, at the end, I will show some great work that suggests that actually these two similarly distinct perspectives can actually be reconciled. They're essentially the same story. So let's start with the uh, ocean heat uptake, the first one. Vance, okay, it won't show. Um, uh, yeah, so the ocean heat uptake perspective. So again, here is the Gregory plot from one model for the couple of CDNs, one on the abrupt flow times CO2. So still you can see this weakening in this model and you really feedback along with time. And accompanied with that, is also the transition in the zonal mean ocean heat uptake anomaly, which is on red, uh, from, from the uh, tropic-centered pattern in the first few decades, slowly trends towards more polar amplified or ectropic-centered pattern along with time, which naturally leads to the question, how radio feedbacks uh, respond or are different to tropical versus ectropical heat uptake? Uh, a lot of studies have addressed this question. So here I'm uh, highlighting one by Brian Rose, who is online, I think, uh, 2014, where they employ a variety of slab ocean models with distinct uh, patterns of a zone, uh, patterns of a zonal bands of a kill flux forcing. So one is centered in ectropics, like this black curve on the left, and one centered in the tropics, and they keep the same global mean ocean heat uptake, just different patterns. And they found the temperature response, which is, which are the color lines, the temperature changed a lot to uh, high latitude ocean heat uptake forcing, but changed a little to tropical, tropic centered forcing, which implies that the feedbacks must be very different. Where should I point to? Uh, indeed, they diagnose the radio feedbacks, which is represented here as a wider gray bar, which is the net feedback, the net radio feedbacks is relative uh, is less stabilizing, less less negative in response to high latitude ocean heat uptake, while more stabilizing to the tropical ocean heat uptake. So that you can see a little perturbation is enough, little surface temperature uh, change is enough uh, for, to balance this forcing. And at that time, they found this difference in radio feedbacks, is mostly coming from the difference in the black bar, which is the short wave clock feedback. And this is a. a Aquaplaning slab ocean was idealized on the mean ocean heat up the forcing. So a follow-up study by Moran Rubenstein, uh, 2016, they employ a more realistic full spatial pattern of ocean heat uptake from the fully coupled models, uh, in this case, the ES1, and they uh, at different time periods. Uh, so you can see as time involves in fully coupled models, they do produce this from uh, tropic center to slowly towards uh, at tropic center ocean heat uptake pattern. And when they uh, diagnosed radio feedback uh, corresponding to this different uh, ocean heat uptake pattern, they found indeed this net, net, uh, net radio feedback strength becomes weaker along with time, and mostly due to the short wave cloud feedback. Uh, so story here, the proposed mechanism here is that in the tropics, because temperatures most, um, uh, are close to moist adibats, so any surface heating or cooling can be efficiently transported to the upper troposphere, leading to outgoing long wave radiation. In other words, this local tropical surface heat fluxes can be balanced locally at top of the atmosphere without changing uh, heat transport or surface temperatures in far remote regions. On the other hand, in the ectropics, because the air, uh, atmosphere there is stably stratified. So any surface heating or cooling tend to be trapped under the boundary layer without reaching the upper troposphere. So that this local surface heat flux anomalies cannot be balanced at top of the atmosphere. So it has to be balanced by uh, heat transport resulting in large surface temperature at global scale. 
so you can see in this for this perspective, when people focus on this ocean heat uptake, uh, they find indeed the tropical and extropical ocean heat uptake can drive different radio feedbacks due to different temperature and cloud response. So they suggest that this weakening you see from fully coupled models uh, with time, weakening feedback strengths with time in fully coupled models is due to the transition of ocean heat uptake pattern from tropic center to ectropic centers. So this is the one way to interpret this uh, mechanism. But independently, we have uh, some other studies focused on the evolution of, I should put, sea surface temperature patterns. And I want to start with this uh, and Tim Andrews et al. 2015 paper, which Maria also showed before. Uh, when they first showed this multi semi-fiber multi-model mean uh, kink here uh, in the feedback, they also looked into the uh, local contribution to this uh, global feedback by looking at global radiation. And they found this total, uh, the total change, in, the total positive change in the global mean feedback is mostly coming from the tropics, and mostly coming from the tropical Eastern Pacific. And further, they found this net uh, local feedback change is mostly due to the clock feedback. And further, when they compared the SSC pattern changes over these different periods, and they found, well, in the tropics, you also see this distinct contrast between the West Pacific and East Pacific, where West Pacific experiences fast warming, fast time scale warming, while Eastern Pacific tends to produce warming on longer time scale, so delayed warming, and also including some part of the Southern Ocean. So at that time, in that paper, they proposed that, uh, they, pro they suggested a dominant role of a tropical cloud feedback associated with this tropical SST pattern changes uh, as a leading hypothesis, or uh, this is their way to interpret this total weakening um, in feedbacks seen in the fully coupled abrupt full time CO2 simulations. On the other hand, if you turn back to historical period, so AMIP simulations forced by observed historical SST patterns, where we see this trend of a feedback towards more negative values, so implying lower climate sensitivity, the orange bars I showed at the beginning. Uh, some studies uh, uh, focus on this, and for example, here, uh, Chen Zhou et al. 2016 paper, where they looked into one model, CAM5, and they found this decadal change in the net uh, radio feedback, is mo again, mostly associated with change in the clock feedback. And they further performed some experiments, for example, they prescribe uniform warming, and they found this decadal change is gone, which suggests that the decadal change in the cloud feedback must be due to changes in SSD pattern, not the change in global mean temperatures. And indeed, over this period, the observations show the spatial pattern of SD trends, which highlighting a warming in the left uh, in the West Pacific and the actual cooling trend in the Eastern Pacific. So they propose that. Uh, this pattern is the reason causing this anomalously negative cloud feedback, which is due to the increase in low cloud cover in the tropical Eastern Pacific. And this theory is further supported in uh, Andrews and Webb 2017, where they use a different model and suggested there's another piece of the, to the story, which is the laboratory feedback. So this is the uh, important part of the mechanism I will talk about here. So I want to spend some time to walk you through this mechanism. Uh, so this mechanism of social with circulation, uh, instability, and the clouds and lapse rate feedback. Uh, so here is the tropical mean, uh, I'm supposed to show the tropical mean circulation. So first I'm plotting this observed uh, SST climatology where you can see the warmer waters in the West Pacific, uh, warm pool regions, and the relatively colder sort of temperatures in the East, the cold town regions. So that's over the warm pool regions, air rises and then descends in the east, forming this climatological uh, worker circulation. So that over the West Pacific, the warm pool regions, air, uh, the temperatures are close to moist adiabat. Uh, and due to the weak temperature gradient, uh, the whole tropospheric temperature will be essentially set by SSCs in these deep convective regions, including air above the Eastern Pacific. But over there, the Eastern Pacific, because surface temperature is relatively colder, which means you have this climatological inversion, which is often quantified as lower tropospheric stability or estimated inversion strength. And this environment it favors low clouds, which is why you usually see uh, low clouds are occurring in the Eastern Pacific stratocumulus deck. And remember, this, low, this type of low clouds uh, have strong cooling effect by reflecting shortwave radiation back to space. Okay, so this is the climatological mean state. 
what happens if the SEC is trying to what a pattern with enhanced west to east gradient, like recently observed? So it turns out this surface warming over the uh, deep convective regions can be efficiently transported to the upper troposphere because of the deep convection and leading to broad uh, tropospheric warming. So that when you look at the Eastern Pacific, you have a warming aloft. The surface is relatively cold because cooling trend. We, first, it implies a more negative lapse rate feedback. And second, now you have a strength in the inversion strength, which leads to more low clouds to grow. And low cloud, as I said, have a strong effect, cooling effect by reflecting shortwave radiation back to space. So this more reflection of shortwave radiation implies uh, for the cooling to for the cooling to the surface, which is a negative cloud feedback. So this is the mechanism uh, they proposed. Uh, to account for why this recent observed acid pattern favors more negative feedback or lower effective climate sensitivity due to this low cloud feedback and lapse rate feedback. Uh, on the other hand, with this model projected long term warming pattern with enhanced warming in the eastern Pacific, this enhanced eastern Pacific surface warming tend to be trapped under the boundary layer because of this climatological inversion strength. Uh, so that first you have less negative lapse rate feedback. And second, now you have weakened inversion, which leads to fewer low cloud cover, allowing for more short wave radiation coming back to surface, which potentially further warms the surface. So that's a positive cloud feedback. So this is why, uh, in general, you, you see, uh, with this projected long term warming pattern, in fully couple models, their total feedback tends to become a weaker or possible change in the net feedback. And this uh, mechanism or theory is further supported by so-called Green's functions. Uh, this Green's functions uh, approach is essentially derived from a large set of uh, fixed uh, fixed SST simulations within an atmospheric model. So now we have uh, uh, two published Green's function with CAMP5 and CAMP4. And you see a lot of the uh, uh, circles here, meaning that for every for each model, each simulation, we prescribe one circle or one pat one of these patches of SSC anomalies and keep elsewhere unchanged so that you can diagnose a global how to see how global radio feedbacks responds to this localized SD forcing. Five minutes. Uh, okay. Yeah, thanks. Uh, and I should note that these grants functions are useful to quantify local and remote impact of regional SD changes on uh, global feedbacks, but their success has to depend on the assumption that climate responses remain linear. Because for grants functions, you're basically linearized, uh, linearly uh, sum uh, summarize all of the individual points of a forcing. So to uh, make it more uh, straightforward, so here I'm showing two examples of localized SD forcing. You can see one in the West Pacific, one in the East Pacific, and it would keep elsewhere unchanged. Uh, and this surface temperature response, net TO radiation response, and zonal mean, the whole vertical profile of temperature change. So first, you can immediately see that West Pacific warming tends to have far remote, strong remote impact, extending to the high latitude and also the whole troposphere, while the Eastern Pacific has relative warming has relatively confined and localized impact only within this patch of the, where forcing is imposed. And second, the West Pacific overall leads to uh, large outgoing radiation at top of atmosphere leading to the, uh, expressed as blue here, leading to negative feedback. While the Eastern Pacific warming just tends to locally tends to drive more radiation coming back to surface. So that's a positive feedback due to low cloud and lapse rate feedback change, as I just ex explained earlier. So at the end, we have this uh, Green's function. What we learned from this Green's function, uh, I often show this figure, but uh, how to interpret this? Well, if you are a math person, you pr prefer to read equations. These are essentially global mean feedback per unit of SD forcing. So you can change, you can think of it as a large matrix representing uh, sensitivity of a global feedback to each individual point of SD forcing. Or if you prefer visualization like me, uh, these plots are essentially showing the global mean feedback response mapped back to where the forcing is imposed. For example, I'm pointing this blue blob on the red uh, in the West Pacific warm pool regions. This means if you have ST warming here by one degree, for example, this localized warming can lead to large globally negative feedback. Well, if you have ST warming in the Eastern Pacific only, and this localized ST forcing will lead to a weak but positive global feedback. So at that time, when we see this result, we found looks like, at least in this model, 
the global feedback, the negative global feedback are essentially determined by as the warming in the West Pacific warm pool, where all other regions tend to give you either less negative or more positive feedbacks. So that the change in feedback should be primarily determined by how much warming from the West Pacific warm pool regions versus uh, how much warming from the East or the global mean. But of course, these are the results we only got from CAP models, two CAP models, so it could be model dependent. Uh, but fortunately, we have exciting thing uh, which you need to wait to see. Uh, can you advance, please? All right, it doesn't work here. We have an exciting project uh, called the Grunt's Function MIP, uh, GF MIP, which is an essential intermodal comparison of the Grunt's functions. So now we have four more models, new models, uh, including some 76 models joining us. Uh, I don't have time to go through all of this. I believe Jonah. Uh, Block Johnson, who's leading Jeff Nip now, uh, will give us a short talk on Friday about this intermodel comparison. Uh, we also have a couple of posters for each individual uh, modeling group's grants function, so please check, out, check them out for more details. Uh, yeah, so, so far I've talked about the uh, tropical SD pattern, the proposed theory, the mechanism, and some evidence we see from the prescribed SD simulation, the grants function experiment. We also see some ex uh, evidence from observations, for example, the key uh, components in this mechanism, which is the low cloud cover over historical period, we do see the increase in trend in the Eastern Pacific over uh, from a satellite product. And second, if you use a series of EBAF and observed SSTs in this paper by uh, Stefan Fuglisterler, I attributed this recent change in the shortwave cloud feedback to the relatively a change in the relative warming in uh, well the broad warm pool regions, but by a better a uh, definition as the warming 30% of the convective regions. Uh, so now you can see for the ocean sheet uptake perspective, people cared about the zonal mean gradient between low latitude and high latitude. But for SSD pattern effect, with this per perspective, people focus on zonal asymmetry between west and the east. Uh, how do we reconcile these two perspectives? Uh, when, I, when we wrote a paper on this topic using prescribed SD simulations, I often got questions or comments from reviewers or other colleagues asking that, can you really use prescribed SD simulation to select feedbacks in fully coupled worlds? Or, or how does your study focus on this tropical west gradients reconcile with early studies? So I realized this is really an important question. Let's address, address it here. Um, so first I'm showing a early paper by Hogstad et al. 2017, where they used a aquaplanet slab ocean model forced by uh, CO2 doubling. And this is a couple models, so the model generates their own SST anomalies. And they further take out this SST anomalies and prescribe to the atmospheric component of that model, which is uh, the atmospheric model, so that these two simulations, one coupled, one prescribed SST simulations, they have exactly the same uh, SST anomalies, so you can see it's just one line here, but different surface heat fluxes because in atmosphere, they're just the prescribed STs. But surprisingly, they found the feedbacks are actually almost identical, suggesting that see, uh, as long as you have the same SST anomaly, it seems like the atmosphere model can generate exactly the same feedback. Uh, no matter this SD anomaly, SD pattern is prescribed or generated by models. And if you're not convinced by this uh, aquaplaning slab ocean model, rather idealized setup, uh, the ongoing work, new work by Ivan Mitowski at uh, Columbia University, and part of his work is being, has been looking at fully coupled simulations using CES-1. For example, here I'm showing one example with four times CO2, a uh, whole 150 year uh, uh, evolution. When he prescribed this evolution of SSC anomalies to the atmospheric component, which is CAMP5, they find almost identical feedbacks um, in, in both global mean values and local uh, distribution. So these two studies, slab ocean and the fully couple models, suggest that as long as you have the same SD patterns, no matter they're, they're, they're forced or uh, generated by models or prescribed, the atmosphere should produce the same feedbacks, suggesting that prescribed SD simulations are indeed useful to study feedbacks. But then the question becomes, how does this reconcile with early studies that do show the dependence of the radiated feedbacks on the ocean heat uptake pattern? Uh, and then we, uh, we want to show a nice study by a recent study by uh, Yuan Zhenli et al. 2021, where they use another cool approach called the Q-flask grant function. Uh, I don't want to go into very details about the technique setup. So the basic idea here is the uh, in the slab ocean model, they prescribe this 
uh, individual localized surface heat flux, so allowing for the SSTs to change. And the key finding of this paper is that using the Q-flux current function and convolved with actual ocean heat uptake pattern from the fully coupled models, you do reproduce this positive change in the tropical clock feedback seen in the fully coupled models. And then this positive change seems to be mostly, uh, mostly coming from the uh, uh, ocean heat uptake in the high latitude in the southern ocean, which is the right top right panel. So suggesting that, well, this is indeed consistent with early study the attribute to the high latitude ocean heat uptake. But they further discovered that the way that southern ocean or high latitude ocean heat uptake changes tropical clock feedback is through changing tropical SSCs. In other words, the ocean heat uptake pattern effect comes about through changing tropical uh, through changing the SSTs. So these are the so heat uptake and SSTs are essentially two equivalent quantities. And I have a key point here which won't show up. Okay. So the uh, so to summarize all the all of these three studies, um, the first study showed that feedback or really feedbacks are essentially seeing the pattern of SSTs, but this SSC itself can be forced or shaped by the ocean heat uptake. That's why they actually uh, can be reconciled together or eventually give the same story. But then this raises another question as to how the southern ocean or how the ocean heat uptake eventually influence the tropics through the uh, teleconnection. What are the mechanisms for this teleconnection? Uh, I don't have time to talk about it uh, here, but we have a couple of relevant and interesting posters, uh, which I'm personally very excited to check out. Okay. Um, yeah, so this time for a summary. Uh, most of my talk, um, most of my talk has been focused on this tropical clock feedback changes related to the tropical SD changes. But there are also other works such as the relative role of a different regions, such as the entire uh, tropical basins, including the tropical Atlantic uh, or the uh, Southern Ocean, where uh, we experience delayed warming longer time series, which can activate local policy feedback or SD change in the North Atlantic associated with AMOC change. Uh, for example, we have a uh, we have another study which shows the okay, which shows the uh, uh, where uh, by again Yuan Jin Li at all twenty seven uh, nineteen where they attributed this semi five intermodal spread in the net feedbacks here uh, to the differences in model simulated AMOC trends. So a lot of things to learn about the different regions, uh, also different feedbacks. Um, I don't have time to expand on this lapse rate feedback uh, mechanism, but uh, in Chappie et al., uh, Chappie and Gregory 2017, they actually, when they ex ex systematically examine the uh, different components, they show the lapse rate feedback is the second leading uh, term that contribute to the total change in the feedbacks. Uh, also, so far, most of the studies are based on semi five models, which highlight this tropical clock feedback. Uh, but we see a substantial change in semi 6 which is arising from at tropical clock feedbacks. So do these clouds or do these feedbacks also uh, depends on the pattern or depends on the evolution of SD patterns? Uh, how does this contribute to the total intermodal spread? Uh, for example, in my 2020 paper, we looked at the correlation between local feedback change versus local SD change across semi-5 and semi-6 models. And we found overall this tropical uh, warm pool relative warming theory explains well for the uh, in general, for all semi five models, but doesn't really hold for semi six models, where it seems like southern ocean starts up. So, what is happening in semi six models? Still, we don't know. It needs to be further investigated. And last, I introduced a, um, a, a, a pro new approach called the Green's function approach. Uh, but as I said, the uh, success of a Green's function have to depend on the extent to which the key feedbacks response are linear. If they're not linear, then probably the current functions are limited for us to interpret this pattern effect. But we actually do see a lot of studies show the nonlinearity of a feedback such uh, with respect to either global mean warming or local warming like this Southern Ocean mixed phase clause in new semi six models. So if Green's function cannot reproduce or capture the features in full couple models anymore uh, or capture this in the model spread. So what should we do? What, what does it leave us to? Um, so more questions. Of, learn uh, to study in this topic. Uh, yeah, because this is the real end of my talk. Thanks. Happy to take questions.
So there are a lot of questions online and we have time for one question. So I chose the shortest one that was online from Clara Desser. Do the greens functions responses in a given model depend on the models biased climatological SSTs? Uh, that's a great question. So for uh, at, at least for CAM4 and CAM5, I think we use observed SST climatology. For SST climatology, we're trying to uh, reduce the model biases. But uh, so there could still be some models uh, biases in the uh, circulation or precipitation. But for at least because we're using prescribed SD simulations, we're, we're trying our best to prescribe the observed SD climatology for the grains functions. Great, thank you. And there are a few more questions, but we'll reserve those for the discussion that's at 10 10 uh, local time. So I think it's breakdown. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, while people are trickling in, uh, we have one. Announcement slash request for the um, online participants. If you could post your questions in Slack, uh, that's going to make it easier for the in person participants to also chime in. And it also gives us a record and we can continue the discussion later on. We'll continue to read questions for the speakers, both from WebEx and from Slack, uh, but it'll, you know, we'll get a more lively interaction and more longer lasting uh, if we try to post the questions in Slack. Some people have already been doing this. You can post figures and papers and everything else. So I strongly encourage you to, to do that. Uh, that being said, I am going to give uh, the last review talk of the morning uh, and sort of the last of the radiatively focused uh, talks. Um, I lead a climate dynamics and data science group at the University of Illinois, and I'm going to talk to you today about conceptual patterns for the uh, conceptual frameworks for the pattern effects, uh, or as I call it, uh, fun with Taylor expansions. I have the job of giving you the math of this. Okay, so how uh, we're going to talk about frameworks. So we're going to start with the old global framework uh, and why it fails. And then we're going to go into some a refined version of the radiative response, which turns out to be the key. Uh, and then some open questions about other parts of the energy budget. Right, so we'll start with a review of Earth's energy budget uh, in a more general form, right? So if we think about the energy budget at the top of the atmosphere, you have an energy input, that's the radiative forcing, that's the temperature independent part. Uh, it leads to a temperature anomaly, T, which in turn leads to more black body radiation mediated by atmospheric feedbacks, and that leads to a radiative response or the radiative damping, R. The overbars denote global mean quantities, and everything I'm going to be talking to you about uh, are small perturbations relative to a pre-industrial equilibrium baseline, but I'm going to skip all the, all the deltas. Right? So if you think of the top of the atmosphere energy imbalance, it's a sum of the forcing and the radiative response due to, due to temperature. And the old framework makes the assumption that the radiative response is linearly proportional to global mean temperature, linked through this global mean radiative feedback parameter lambda, right? So that turns the energy budget equation into N equals F plus lambda T, um, which has been sort of how the field has been thinking about this since at least Gregory 2002, if not earlier, and how a lot of the estimates of climate sensitivity are made. And this is still the basis even for sure with, with small modifications, a uh, few of which I'm gonna talk to you about. Why this matters is because if you know lambda, you know climate sensitivity from that energy budget equation, right? You set the equilibrium condition, which is by definition, the energy imbalance is zero for the system to be in equilibrium, uh, which means that if n equals zero, the equation becomes f plus lambda t equals zero, and ignoring the fact that I'm cavalier about my minus signs, uh, the equilibrium temperature becomes forcing divided by feedback. So if you have a very strong damping feedback, a very negative feedback, it doesn't take a lot of warming for the system to, to balance the forcing. If on the other hand, the feedback is weak, so more positive, closer to zero, then the earth has to work harder to balance the radiative forcing through radiative damping. So it's all about how hard as the earth has to work in order for that radiative damping to balance out the radiative forcing, or at least that's how uh, I like to think about it. And as you've seen from both UA's talk and Maria's talk, there's a problem with this framework because you can take two different SST patterns. 
You can take the recent observed SST pattern from 1979 when we have good observations of SSTs, and you can take a long-term warming pattern from above quadrupling simulations and run, two atmosp run an atmospheric model with both patterns. So the olive bars are models run with the recent observed SST, and the blue bars are models run with the long-term warming pattern. Same microphysics, same boundary layer parametrization, same convective scheme, same atmospheric physics. The only thing that's different are the sea surface temperature patterns. Uh, and what you end up with are very different radiative feedbacks and very different inferences of equilibrium climate sensitivity, where the, where the difference is as much as the uncertainty from atmospheric feed radiation, right? So this is sort of a review of UA and uh, Maria's talk in terms of this energy budget equation. So the forcing is the same. We know the heat uptake, we can measure it in these models. So where the problem is, is that radiative response is slightly more complicated than just saying that global radiation is linearly proportional to global temperature change. It has to be a function of the pattern. So that's what we're gonna be talking about for most of the rest of the talk is refined thinking about that radiative response and how it depends on the patterns of temperature and some conceptual frameworks for how we think about that. And then I'm gonna leave some big open questions that are gonna lead into the rest of the workshop about all the other terms uh, in, the, in this uh, energy budget equation. The heat uptake, the forcing, and the patterns driving that, that uh, function. Okay, so what would a refined view of the radiative response look like? I'm not gonna go historically here. I'm gonna go through what I think makes, makes most sense based on our current understanding. And it is conceptual, not quantitative. So hold your questions until the end about that. So if you go back to, I think this is from Rho 2008, uh, where Gerard says, feedbacks are really just Taylor series in disguise. So if you want to link global radiation response to global temperature, you can think of it as a Taylor expansion as where the feedback lambda is just the first derivative of global radiation with respect to local temperature. So if you want to refine that view, you could just take a different expansion. Like you could consider local radiation depending on regional temperatures, uh, and you could uh, write the equation this way, where now radiation is a sum of all of the different regional sensitivities of radiation to temperature. This is from Armour 2013. Uh, it was a paper that really pushed the field forward, very important and also wrong. Um, then again, it's based on the formalism of Budico and Sellers from 1969. So, you know, if Kyle misstepped, he misstepped in the footsteps of giants. Um, it turns out that what he's missing here are non-local effects. There's, if you think of the total energy budget, there are non-local terms where you actually have to consider radiation at every location y as a function of temperature everywhere else. This becomes sort of an unwieldy, an unwieldy function. Uh, so instead you can summarize it and just say, well, let's just look at how global radiation depends on regional temperatures. Uh, instead, of instead of thinking of global radiation with respect to global temperature, we just do a more complex Taylor expansion with respect to regional temperatures everywhere. And if you multiply and divide by global temperature, then what you end up with is this convolution of a radiative response with the temperature pattern, which really becomes your feedback. So you can go back to your framework of global radiation is proportional to global temperature, but that proportionality we have a more refined understanding of it as coming from a convolution of a sensitivity function with the warming pattern. And the sensitivity function, uh, UA and Maria have talked about it already, I guess, uh, it's what we would call a Green's function uh, because it's derived using the response to delta functions. So we really, so the, the function, the plot on the left is this, sensitivity of global radiation to regional temperature. And if you multiply that by the pattern of warming, then you get you know, your radiative feedback. And your, you know, if you sum over it, your radiative 
um, if you multiply by global temperature, you get your radiative response. So this is sort of our conceptual, I would say our best simple mathematical conceptual understanding of the pattern effect as being a convolution of changing warming patterns times the sensitivity of global radiation to regional temperatures. And if you look at the recent historical warming patterns, you know, there, there's a lot of warming in the West Pacific where you have a very, where you, which leads to a very strong negative response. Um, and you have cooling in the East Pacific and the Southern Ocean where you'd have a positive response. So both of those features lead to a lot of outgoing radiation. So very efficient radiative damping. Whereas in the future, that's going to flip. In the future, that's going to flip. You actually have more warming in the East Pacific and the Southern Ocean, which are the red regions in the Green's function. So you get much less efficient radiative response. So the Earth is going to have to work harder and warm proportionally more to balance out the forcing. This makes sense? Okay, I see some nods in the audience. It's always good. Okay, so this is sort of that ref refined framework of Earth's energy budget where that radiative response is linked to global temperature through this radiative sensitivity convolved with the pattern of warming. So how do we reconcile this with some of the older frameworks that actually preceded this sort of Green's function informed uh, understanding like the time dependent feedbacks uh, or uh, the Winton et al where you keep the feedback the same but you modify heat uptake with an efficacy term or this most more recent works in terms of tropical temperatures and stability. So I'm going to try to very briefly go through, go through these as well, starting with the time dependent feedbacks. So if we go back to the previous slide, right, where the, the feedback is a convolution of the regional sensitivity of global radiation uh, and the warming pattern, Radiation should respond very quickly, right? And you see this in, a, in fixed SST experiments. Radiation adjusts within a year. So if you want to have slowly evolving feedbacks, it has to come from the fact that the patterns evolve. So conceptually, the way I think we, most of us think about it is that time dependence in the feedback really comes from the fact that the patterns evolve in time. So then if you look at, at say, this, this figure from Zhou 2016, uh, where the orange are the feedbacks you get from the long-term warming pattern and the black uh, line is the feedback from the recent warming, then the reason you get is much more negative feedbacks um, from 1952 to 2000 is because you have this warming pattern that's been trending towards much more negative feedbacks and in the future we expect, uh, we expect that to flip. So you can sort of, and I'll show a figure later, you can sort of understand both of these feedbacks within the same Green's function, the same sensitivity, but different patterns at different times. Same thing if you look just in coupled models. So if we now go to this very um, traditional view from Andrews 2015 of time-dependent feedbacks, you can also think of that time-dependent feedback which is evidenced on the right by that curvature in the Gregory plot. The blue are the first 20 years, the red uh, are years 20 to 21 to 150. The feedback changes in time because the pattern changes between the first 20 years and years 21 to 150. So this is sort of an updated conceptual framework that, can, that brings the pattern effect and time-dependent climate sensitivities together where you can think of time-dependent climate sensitivity as arising from time-evolving SST patterns interacting with a time-invariant radiative sensitivity to patterns. Does that make sense? Okay, so that hopefully fixes, fixes that pattern, but there's something that I always got confused about, and a lot of people, I think, do. Don't confuse these two. There's two ways to think of regional feedbacks. The Green's function is a sensitivity of global radiation to regional temperatures. So that dark blue in the West Pacific means that if you warm in the West Pacific, you get a huge global radiation response. But as UA showed, 
a lot of that doesn't happen in the West Pacific. A lot of that radiation to space actually goes out in the in the dry subtropics, right through radiative fins and other processes. So that's the sensitivity of global radiation to regional temperatures. That's a conceptual product. Like we'd never see that in the satellite record, for example. What we might see is what we see on the right, which is the regional radiation with respect to global temperature. And that's a different perspective. That's where the radiation comes out. So the plot on the left, the Green's function is what forces radiation what regions force radiation and the figure on the right is where does the radiation come out? So for example, that big red spot in the East Equatorial Pacific, you get a lot of radiation in there, but some of that is actually forced by temperature changes in the West Pacific altering the Walker circulation. If you like math, you can think of it as different ways to sum over this Jacobian of radiation at a location Y with respect to temperature at location X. And you can sum over radiation to get a Green's function, or you could sum over temperature to understand where the radiation comes out. Five minutes. Okay. Um, heat uptake efficacy is another framework that people have been using. Uh, and this comes back to Hansen 1995, which says that really you can write an equilibrium balance between forcing and feedback, uh, say between CO2 forcing and temperature or heat uptake and temperature, you have to use different feedbacks. Heat uptake engenders a different radiative feedback uh, compared to CO2. And what Winton et al. did was they said, well, if you modify heat uptake with this efficacy term epsilon, then you can change, then you can use the same feedback as the long term equilibrium feedback. And if you add these two together, then you can use a single constant feedback, but you have a modified heat uptake. And the trick is that that modified heat uptake is actually part heat uptake and part radiative damping R. And the way to think about this, that modifier is actually just the ratio of the feedback with respect to CO2 forcing and the equilibrium feedback to with respect to heat uptake. And as Rose et al. showed, you can sort of think of both of them as the same radiative sensitivity actuating, sorry, different patterns actuating the same radiative sensitivity. Uh, you can sort of infer the, the warming, the temperature pattern due to heat uptake by looking at the difference between long-term and short-term warming. So you get this, the, the pattern associated with heat uptake has a lot of warming in the Southern Ocean and East Pacific, which leads to more positive, uh, which leads to more uh, positive feedbacks. Okay, uh, very quickly, what's happening with this, with the warm pool? All right, so again, if you look at the, sens the sensitivity of radiation to temperature, you see a big role for the warm pool. So you might simplify this and say, well, really radiative response is a function of how much the warm pool warms relative to the global temperature. So you can think of T sharp as some measure of warm pool warming. Dong et al. did this for the warm pool. Fugli Staller used the warmest 30% of SSTs. They're sort of equivalent. I think Stefan's metric is slightly more interesting because it can account for the fact that the warm pool might not be in the same place between different models or between models and observations. So by doing that, you kind of get away from this DRDTX. You're no longer tied to a specific geographic point. You're more tied to a physical, uh, to, to a physical quantity, like where is the convection happening? Okay, so this is sort of that refined view, and I want to end with a few open questions. First is, this is all qualitative. We know that we, this Green's function, regional sensitivity-based understanding. If we actually try to quantitatively reconstruct the radiative response, so black is the feedback from AMIP simulations, red is a Green's function reconstruction, this is from Dong 2019, it works decently well for the historical record. It gets qualitatively the increase in feedback in the long term, but it doesn't fully capture it quantitatively. And we don't really know why that is. Could be a nonlinearity, either in amplitude or in the spatial pattern. Could be issues with, you know, warm pool changing. Um, 
And then the other question is, how do we constrain this Green's function? If you want to use this formalism, you need about 150 degrees of freedom to constrain a Green's function. We got 20 years of satellite data. How do we get observational constraints on the sensitivity of radiation to temperature? The other questions relate to the other parts of the, of the energy budget. What are the warming patterns? Where do they come from? Where are they going? Right? What are we seeing in the historical record versus the long-term warming? One way the field has historically thought about this is, you know, you have different modes with different patterns in their time evolution. But what features, what modes are we seeing? Internal variability, is it ENSO, PDO? Is this the force response? What are these patterns doing in the future? How will our models capturing? A lot of the rest of the review talks are gonna be focused more on some of these questions. And I don't think we have good conceptual models to think about, uh, about the interaction of these warming patterns with the radiative sensitivity. And then the last set of questions relates to this coupled problem, right? You have heat uptake, you have temperature, you have radiation. And really most of what the field, most of what the pattern effect has dealt with is sort of the AMIP or CFMIP problem. What is the sensitivity of radiation to regional warming? And that's what these traditional Green's functions have been doing. But we need to also understand what sets the warming patterns. And there's a couple of interesting papers just now coming out. Stuker et al. computed the sensitivity of the warming patterns with response to radiative to regional radiative forcing. So this is sort of a Green's function in radiative forcing. And it shows that you can get the, the patterns that way. Uh, Newsom et al. in 2020 do the same, trying to look at the coupling between heat uptake and temperature. What is the sensitivity? Is there a pattern effect for heat uptake? Does the surface warming pattern impact heat uptake? It turns out, yes, it does. And this is only for the passive component. Uh, and then there's this Q flux greens functions, which are helping us understand how regional Q fluxes in the mixed layer help shape temperature patterns. So we're now just now, I think, starting to scratch the surface of how do we think about the rest of these couplings. Most of the field has been focused on that sensitivity of radiation to temperature. Of course, is this pattern effect or is this just coupled climate dynamics? Um, and where do you draw the distinction? I don't think it really matters. It seems like a lot of people are converging towards similar um, linear frameworks. And one last big open question for me, near-term warming. Right? If you think of long-term climate sensitivity, I just told you, you can think of it as forcing divided by feedback, where feedback is the sensitivity of radiation to temperature. But if you think of near-term warming, one way to think about this is forcing divided by feedback plus heat uptake efficiency, not efficacy, efficiency, where that kappa is the sensitivity of heat uptake to temperature. Does that have a pattern effect? Does this very anomalous pattern over the last 40 years, does that affect the global heat uptake? Is the, another way to put it, are we living through a time of anomalous global heat uptake? And if so, as the pattern changes, is it just the damping that's gonna change? Is the heat uptake gonna change? This can have implications on much shorter time scales uh, than climate sensitivity. And I think that's it. I'm gonna leave up this, this summary slide um, of the conceptual framework for the pattern effect and time evolving climate sensitivity. And I'm gonna take questions. Thank you, Christy. So I do see a question online from Ben, or uh, actually first question online from Claire Desser. And any of you guys online, if you do have a question, I'm, you know, if you want to clarify, feel free to unmute yourself. So Claire's question, don't we need to use Green's function based on the model's SST climatology, not the observed SST climatology to understand the pattern effect of the model's future forced SST response? That is a great question, Clara. Thank you for bringing it up. Uh, and can I screenshot that and use it to get more computing time from NCAR? Uh, yes, we do want that. Ideally, we would want sort of both. Um, and there's gonna be a brief discussion of Green's function MIP on Friday, and these are great points to bring up. 
Part of the reason why you might want to use the observed SSD climatology is because it makes it easier to compare different models greens functions. If what you're interested in is that sort of that one part of the loop of how does radiation depend on SSTs, if you want to compare it to observations, maybe try to constrain them based on the series record or AMIP simulations, then again, you would want to use the observed SSD climatology. If you want to understand the long-term model behavior, then I think you're right. You would want to use the model's climatology as your baseline. It's just a very practical matter of limited computational resources. Okay, and a couple other questions in the Slack channel. One from Ben Sanderson. Nice talk. Regarding the Green's function approximation, can we really consider the regional sensitivities in different locations to be independent? Wouldn't the effect of a temperature perturbation on global TOA flux in a given location be modulated by the warming patterns elsewhere? Could there be a lower dimensional basis sets in which we could construct the feedback decomposition? That is a great question. And that's why I've sort of at least briefly tried to make the claim that this is a conceptual framework and a qualitative framework, not really a quantitative framework. So it's probably, I have high confidence in the fact that yes, if you warm in the convecting regions, you get a strong negative radiative response. I wouldn't trust the numbers for exactly some of these reasons. There are nonlinearities and you know, attempts to reconstruct, oh, sorry, attempts to reconstruct the long-term response show it. So for example, that figure in UA's plot where the Green's function fails to reconstruct the abrupt warming, that's actually done by imposing abrupt quadrupling anomalies on observed SSD climatology. So it gets around Clara's question of, are we using the wrong climatology? That's a self-consistent example and the Green's function still fails because there are nonlinearities. Uh, and we don't know if they're just in the magnitude of temperature, maybe you have to have temperature squared, or if they're in the patterns. And I think Ben has raised a great point. There are going to be these spatial nonlinearities. Imagine that you warm, imagine that, you know, the warm pool, you, you, you warm in the East Pacific a lot, and you sort of shift convection in an El Nino-like pattern. What if you then impose an SST pattern in what was the warmest SST? You're probably gonna get a different response, right? So if you think through this a bit, there's a lot of ways in which you could have these nonlinearities. Um, and you see it in the Zhou 2017 paper, for example, the Green's function does a much better job of reconstructing the radiative response to ENSO than it does to a uniform pattern probably because ENSO is more like the Green's function in terms of these very sharp regional anomalies, but a uniform pattern where everywhere warms, it doesn't do quite as well of a job. So lots of interesting questions. Um, I'd say this is more of a qualitative way to think about it than, than really an ultimate quantitative way. And I see on the clock it's 10.09, so we're about to head into the discussion, so perhaps we can carry these questions into the discussion for you online folks. We do have your Brady Bunch tiles up on our screen. So if you do want to chime in or anything, um, a really good visual is just turn on your camera or raise your hand and we can all see that and we'll call on you. So the next question, um, another online one, unless anyone in the room has any questions, um, they're putting you to shame right now. I'm just going to say that. Uh, Diego Jimenez de la Cuesta should not be also important to look directly into the ocean, how the dynamics of the ocean change? Um, the answer to that question is depending on what you're interested in, right? Um, I'd say generally, yes, we definitely should be looking into the ocean. Um, it depends what you're interested in. If you're interested in just how top of the atmosphere radiation depends on surface warming, we seem to be doing a good job just by looking at surface temperatures. If we care about, sorry, just looking at surface temperature patterns, if we care about where these patterns come from, where they're going, if we care about near-term warming, which is a balance of radiative response and heat uptake, then yes, we do need to look into the ocean. But again, it sort of depends what the question you're, you're asking is. In general, yes. 
a question from Peter Huber. If non if non entities are important, are seasonal variations in SSTs, among other ocean, atmosphere, land seasonal effects, important when considering radiative responses? That's a very good question. Um, could be. Um, UA's Green's function, I think Chen's Green's function, so the Dong 2019 and the Zhou 2017 Green's functions are built using seasonal Green's functions. So the way you reconstruct global radiation is you actually derive a sensitivity for each season and then convolve it to the temperature anomalies in each season. Um, I, it makes a difference. I don't know if it's first order or second order, but it does make a difference. So yes, you, it is important to consider those. Great. Um, so that's all the questions that we had for you, Christy. I think I'm going to hand it off to you and Maria to start officially start this more, discussion. I think. Um, but we can just move into the general discussion. There's one from there's one from Ben Sanderson. Oh, sorry, I just answered that. Never mind. Answer that one. Okay. So you first have to make a plan. Well, yeah, I think the plan. So the idea is to have now an hour, uh, uh, a long time to really. Thank you. Sorry. The overarching idea is was to have a real time now for clarifying questions for the first three talks. So this is really setting the stage for the follow up discussion. Um, I would say. Oh, I forgot first. Sorry. So we really kind of were hoping that there's a lot of participation from the in-person people as well. So we want you to ask clarifying questions, not just, you know, is this thing wrong because you haven't considered nonlinearities, but if anything wasn't clear, if you have any questions because this is the first time you're seeing some of this material, this is sort of your time to ask questions of the of us, the people that gave the review talks, but also general questions. And it's not just for us to answer, but if other people in the audience or online want have the answer, we really encourage you to step up to the microphone and 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 speak up, right? So I'm comfortable with awkward silences. Um, and we're going to push that until you know we get people to participate. So, Chris, this isn't a great question, but you're begging for a question. So, hold on, Chris. Let's make sure that microphone's on. For now, you can use this. Yue, you want to come? Yeah. Up? So, um, just outside, I, I was asking Yue this question, then we didn't get a chance to actually finish it. I was wondering um, within the the greens function plot. Uh, that's quite beautiful and, and contoured nicely um, for presenting. I'm wondering if in the actual field, is there more rich sort of inhomogeneities within the Western, that huge Western Pacific contour that sort of gets saturated or is it a little more patchy than that? Or is it really that uh, smooth and broad uh, as someone who kind of looks at instrumental records and observations and stuff like, can we get a little more fine grained information? on that pattern in the West Pacific warm pool? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, uh, well, first for the applause, because the West Pacific they really has strong remote impact. So we just uh, use that smooth out the, the color map. Um, but I think, uh, well, for camp five, when we show, or camp four, when we show this large blob in the West Pacific, I think overall it's pretty smooth, but that seems to be model dependent, like in this camp five, although it could be also due to the model setup, simulation setup, but uh, you, you could see more spatial structures in this CAM5 screen functions. So I guess uh, it probably also depends on how models simulate this circulation change in response to SSD patterns, uh, and that part could be model dependent. So as to which part in the broad West Pacific warm pool really stands out. Um, yeah, so I think that, that uh, that's a good question to really look into individual models. Yeah, I mean, this, this makes it look more equatorially focused. And I'm just wondering if in the plot that you showed, UA, not this one, but with the yeah. big, more circular <laughs> contour, if you um, looked at the contours a little bit different, would it also show an equatorial maximum? 
like this one, if, unless my eyes are deceiving me, in the West Pacific, it looks like it's actually strongest on the equator in the Western Pacific. Um, yes, my impression is that for my Grand's function, it looks more, yeah, for some reason, more smooth and highlighting the overall big regions. Uh, but that's a good, good idea to look into the specific contours. Um, but I think overall, even when we look at all six, six uh, new models for function, they overall highlight this equatorial Pacific as largest uh, impact. Maybe I can show you. Uh, so you do see some model, uh, intermodal spread. Uh, yeah, please stay in this stage, in this play page. Uh, but overall, you can see multiple models tend to highlight the biggest impact in the uh, equatorial Pacific. Although it looks like Camp 4, four is uh, the one who really shows this smooth, although it could be uh, also due to the power maps. But overall, it's like, it looks like the Equatorial Pacific really stands out. Uh, I see two questions in the room and one online. So let's take one question in the room and then we'll go online. Hi, uh, I'm Moritz uh, Günther from MPI. I wondered if you could elaborate a bit more on that statement that the Kyle Armour 2013 perspective failed, in your opinion? Like, I kind of see that it doesn't account for the remote impact, but I wondered if it might maybe still be good enough, or if not, why, why you think it's, it isn't? This is partially just me ribbing on my postdoc advisor. I think, it, I think it works fine for a lot of different purposes, especially if you're thinking about zonal mean, idealized perspective, it still works pretty well but you do have to be careful because i think that we think some of the features that come out of that perspective can be misleading for example if you look at if you look at the classic zonal mean feedback pattern from any number of zonal mean aqua planet ebms papers you see this pattern with very positive feedbacks in the high latitudes very negative feedbacks in the subtropics and then going, going back to near zero feedbacks right on the equator. Um, and that near zero feedback on the equator can be misleading because that comes from this notion that a warming on the equator doesn't lead to a lot of local outgoing radiation. But that's because a lot of the radiation ends up going down the radiative fins and going out into the subtropics. So you can get some misleading results from that. Um, especially with respect to what is the radiative response to warming right on the equator. Uh, the second reason I say it sort of fails is because if you try, if you try to use that local regression to reconstruct the radiative response or the time dependent feedback in different models, it doesn't, it, it works even less quantitatively than the Green's function. The Green's function might have an offset but it does capture the overall trend towards a less stabilizing feedback better than the regional than the regional perspective. Great, thanks. Ida Persa, do you want to ask your question? Go ahead and unmute. Sure. Um, so the, yeah, this is Gita Prasad from the University of Texas at Austin, and this is a question that I guess spans all three of the speakers. I was wondering if we can clarify a little bit better what we understand about the dependence of the pattern effect on the background climate state, um, or like, I guess some of these greens function patterns, how much do they depend on how warm our background climate is? So do we expect if we added these deltas of SST onto a 4XCO2 equilibrium climate, do we expect the same radiative response as pre-industrial? How well do we understand where that crossover where it is linear and where that linearity breaks down? Um, I don't know if you can see me shrugging, but I think Joe and I in the audience might have a better answer to that one. Um, can, <clears throat> Hi, uh, Jonah Block Johnson from University of Reading. Um, in the Slack in the, pig, the papers and figures channel, I added a figure for this for HADCM3, where I have a, a, the Jacobian reconstructed for uh, one case where we used just the pre-industrial for HADCM3 and another where we used the, uh, uh, I think, had IFFT from the last uh, 40 or 50 years. And, I mean, HADCM3 is a relatively older model, so the control is pretty different 
uh, in terms of its state, but the Green's functions are actually pretty different between the two cases. So I do think that this, there could be uh, some basis for, for assuming they might be different in other models. I think there's more generic evidence that if you do a, the, the feedbacks change in, in different with, with four times, eight times, 16 times CO2, if the global feedbacks change so much, you'd expect that the greens functions would also be different. I see Ben, you have your hand raised. Is it in relation to this or can we hold off on asking, having you ask your question? Uh, it's, it's, it's a different question. Okay, so we'll take uh, the three questions in the room and then we'll go to you. Hi, um, hi, I'm Yuan Zhen Ling. Um, I'm asking the kind of technical one on SSC green function. One is about the ice and one is about the land. So when you are um, perturbed the SSC patch on a grid point that has ice covered, um, how do we deal with the ice and some um, we will perturb the warm anomaly and the cold anomaly and probably ice have the this nonlinearity so will act different when you give it warming and give it cooling so how do we deal with this situation this is about ice and another question about the land so when we are um, perturbing SSC anomaly and the that the land warming freely evolve right? And so would that freely evolved land warming contribute to the different um, radiation response that can probably expand the nonlinearity, probably? So that's my question. Very good question. Though. Very briefly on the land, a big limitation is the way it's very hard to prescribe land temperatures. Which I think is a big part of why we these Green's function and AMIP experiments are run just with prescribed SSTs and the land, you know, just adjust. There's one way you can sort of argue your way around that by saying that land responds pretty quickly. So if you're interested in these slow evolutions of the feedback, that slow time scale is almost certainly associated with with changes in the ocean pattern. Um, but I think part of it is just technical limitations in how we can set up these simulations. Do you want to take the ice? Yeah, CS, if you're thinking about the active CS yeah. or CS coupling in full couple models, I think that's the part for all this prescribed SST grants function. That's the part of the work that all grants function have not done good job because they're prescribed. So all we can do is prescribe CS change in response to a certain part of the SST changes. For example, for CAMP4, for, for polar patches, so if we increase one degree or three degree of warming, which is the notch where we prescribe CS uh, decline in response to this or corresponding to this uh, SST warming. But that says for this total, or if you're considering a state change and then CS and then CS albedo feedback, that's probably not uh, fully reflected in this prescribed SD simulations. Yeah. And even that, I think uh, for the six models, I forgot, Jonah may correct me. Only one or two models consider this CS effect or prescribing the CS change. Uh, for simplicity, most models just uh, uh, only focus on the ST perturbation, ignoring the S uh, CS change in the high latitude because it's hard to take into a, this active uh, coupling in the prescribed ST simulations. Um, yeah. We had another question on Slack. Uh, and can go to the next question? Or... There, there's, oh. Hi, so uh, a little bit higher level, but I noticed uh, in UA's talk, you were talking, oh, sorry, introduce myself. I'm Kay McMonigle uh, from NC State. Um, so in UA, in your talk, you were uh, talking about some results uh, that talked about like high latitude or extra tropics compared to low latitude um, tropical regions as far as ocean heat uptake. Um, and then you focused mostly in on the Southern Ocean, but I guess I was wondering if there's evidence that the Northern Hemisphere high latitudes play a role. And I'm an oceanographer, so I'd expect that to be very different in terms of the oceanography than the, the Southern Ocean. So if it is playing a role, kind of what the differences are uh, hemispherically. Uh, yeah, the, the reason I'm focusing on the Southern Ocean heat up, or the telecom from the Southern Ocean heat up to tropical SDs is uh, first based on 
uh, some Q flux grain function, which does highlight this connection from the southern hemisphere highlighted to maybe Yuanjun could correct me in his work uh, in her work. Uh, seems like the southern hemisphere highlighted to ocean heat uptake has stronger impact on the setting the tropical STs. Well, at least in her paper, I think the results seems like the northern hemisphere has relatively weaker impact on the tropical STs. Uh, yeah, like this. So they specify the mostly coming from a poleward of 30 south, 30 degrees south. So that's the biggest contribution uh, where it comes from. Um, and I, I think that the reason is also related to the teleconnection, how to, how to link the Southern Ocean SSD or heat, heat uptake anomalies to the tropical, eventually to the tropical SSDs. I think we have a lot of the uh, uh, teleconnection work, which suggests that the difference between Northern Hemisphere to Southern Hemisphere, which we can, uh, Sarah can correct me if uh, uh, I'm uh, speaking wrong. So it uh, looks like this northern to he northern hemisphere to tropics versus southern hemisphere to tropics are different related to this ITCZ position. So uh, so you could expect the difference, a uh, different impact uh, through this teleconnection uh, pathways. Thanks. All right. Should we take a question from Ben since he's been waiting online patiently? Yeah. Hey. Nice talk, everyone. Um, so. I guess my question is is whether we're throwing away information. Because um, if we know broadly that the system, you know, we know that we can fit the global mean evolution of the system as a function of a few exponential decaying time series. Um, and we can broadly map this to the warming of the deep ocean and the mixed layer and then and, and the land surface or something like that. Um, then does it make sense to by, by, by framing the problem as a greens function, which is defined on a latitude longitude grid, you know, as you said, Christy, that we we don't have there's too many degrees of freedom to fit that from 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 history from historical information. But if we use the fact that we know that the emerging signals of climate change on different timescales are co coherent entities with uh, with well defined spatial patterns, and then we frame our greens function that way. Does the problem but then become tractable? You know, if all we're looking for is the effect of deep ocean warming on top of atmosphere radiative flux plus shallow ocean warming plus land surface warming, that's three. That's that's three variables. We could probably fit three variables. That makes sense. It makes a lot of sense to me because that's what we tried to do um, in the 2017 paper is basically the dimensionality reduction along eigenmodes of the force response and yeah then it turns out you only need three eigenmodes three spatial patterns three feedbacks to to get this and maybe that helps you a bit with the nonlinearities as well because then you're not trying to reconstruct it using regional patterns you're trying to reconstruct it using larger patterns right so yeah i think it's doable and um we've tried to do it a bit i don't think that paper caught on quite as much as some of the other uh, approaches, um, but especially if we want to bring in observational constraints, then I think some form of data reduction, regularization will, will, will have to be done. Plus, it might be a different perspective that might help us deal with some of these issues of nonlinearities of, as you've said, moving away from geographical perspective. So I highly encourage that, that, that course, that line of work. Let's talk more over the, over the next week. All right, so we have three questions in the room. Um, so we'll take those three and then go back online. So go ahead. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Bo Zhang. I'm, uh, my affiliation is Princeton University and GFDL. Uh, thank you for the talk. And for the Green's function, I do have a question related to the global mean for the SD response at each grid point. So in the GFDL model, we find that the figure you are showing, it basically depends on the model's resolution. So if you have a higher resolution, you will see much weaker signals in the tropics. And then there is a, the phys actual physical area is depends on the latitude. So basically in the tropics, you will have a larger area, but in the higher latitude, you will have a smaller area. So we are proposing that when we presenting those kind of figures, we should consider the actual physical area. So signals should be normalized by the physical area of that, that 
great point. And another uh, thing I want to discuss is that in the high latitude, whenever there is sea ice, so as uh, the previous uh, mentioned, uh, so actually in the modeling community, I'm, I'm not sure. So whenever there is sea ice, can the model feel the actual perturbation, the SST perturbation you give to them? So it actually, the that's kind of I'm confused. Confused, about. well, since you had a comment, I'm going to ask you a question. How do you deal with the sea ice in your greens function? Yeah, that that's a uh, that's a thing. We actually add some. Uh, let's say we have like perturbation for four Kelvin, and we give it that to the model, but the model doesn't feel the four K perturbation. It will compute its own. Surface temperature. So that's the thing I'm worried about as a, about the technical part of the range function approach. What would you recommend is a good way around that? Uh, I'm, uh, no, I'm actually saying so it's more tricky in the higher latitudes. So, but in the tropics and in ice free region, I think we are totally fine. I, I think it's a really good point about. There's lots of different types of units you can use to construct the Jacobians. Um, I just wanted to say that the one that was shown here was corrected for area, um, but it's in general like yeah, that that's a thing to keep in mind. Is if you're if you're not careful, you can have things look like they're weaker in certain regions just because the area of your cells is different. But in that case, we we've corrected for it. Yeah, that's true. Anyway, thank you. I'll make one generic comment. Thank you, Bosang. This is one of the few workshops where we encourage more of a comment than a question. So if you have you know, comments and like that, please make them. We're, this, this is a discussion. It's not just for questions for us. If you have something to contribute, please stand up and you know, make a comment. Oh, yeah, and I want to just add some comments to the first uh, two questions about resolution and the equal area. Uh, for resolution, I totally agree that models response in terms of clouds or circulation might be sensitive to the resolution of the models. But, of course, due to computational limit, uh, uh, computational results, most of the models just run one set of simulations using one particular resolution. So it looks like the GFDL model has this two resolution comparison, which is great. So. Uh, we have uh, uh, this resolution comparison. I think Jonah is also showing uh, HACM, HACM3 occurrence uh, function with different amplitudes. So 1K, 3K, or 4K, which shows the sensitivity of the occurrence function to different setup, which is uh, definitely great to see uh, beyond CAM4, CAM5, just this one set of simulations. And second, for the equi uh, equal area, um, I don't really follow that. That's the represent presentation of this plot or you, when you actually calculate the uh, sensitivity. I think for, at least for my CAM4 or CAM5 plots, I'm using or I'm plotting this global mean and, and then normalized by the uh, area of the grid point or the patch. So it's, I think that eventually what I'm showing is normalized by area, so it doesn't have this uh, equal area problem in the plot itself, but definitely it should be um, sensitive to the area of the patch of the forcing you impose the model. Large patches or small patches could result in different, for example, gradient in the tropical acid gradient uh, in the tropical SSC, so that could lead to some differences. Uh, uh, Stuka, University of Hawaii. Um, could you pull up the plot again with the uh, green function map? The six maps. So maybe the question is for you, uh, Jonah and UA. Um, so it seems like the um, the zonal dipole between the warm pool and the eastern tropical Pacific is a consistent response uh, in the different AGCMs. But in the rest of the tropics, the tropical Indian Ocean and the tropical Atlantic, the results results differ quite a lot and you proposed a hypothesis for the setting for the explaining this pattern in the tropical pacific um have you true thought about the what dynamics might be responsible for this different responses we see in the rest of the tropical belt yeah i totally uh, agree that um well most of the 
the under, what my understanding so far is based on this cat models, which highlight the tropical Pacific. But great that we now have different models, which could account for model differences. Uh, like in some models, they highlight the Atlantic or as Malta said, uh, Indian Ocean across models. And some of the models actually also highlight uh, Southern Ocean like in MPI icon model. Uh, so it also comes with the fact that if we only use CAMP4 or CAMP5 grants function and try to see if they can reproduce intermodal spread in fully coupled models, and actually it can't. So it seems like models, for 76 models. So different fully coupled models probably do different, uh, generate their own pattern effect, which may, may not be fully explained by this CAMP's model-based physics that highlight the tropical Pacific. So could be some different uh, stories happening in the tropical Atlantic Ocean or Southern Ocean. Um, so that's, that's something that we definitely uh, could explore using this GF MIP, the, the intermodal comparison. Or Jonah, you want to say something about this difference across models? So I, I, I agree it's really strange that the, some of the models seem to have more there and some less. And I checked to see in HADCM3 if it just was a, reflected that there was more tropical ascent there. Because it maybe maybe these patterns are sort of broadly mapping where there's tropical convection, but actually that doesn't seem to be the case. There's not, and in most parts of the world, it does follow tropical convection pretty closely, but not there. There's just this large negative feedback, and it's not quite clear what exactly the reason for that. So it's an open question. Thank you. So one comment on that: you know, we've we've talked about the Green's function because I think it's one of the more mature formalisms or frameworks. It doesn't have to be the only one, right? Like Stefan Fuglistaller will argue robustly that we shouldn't be looking in, 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 in geographic space, right? Maybe we should be looking in other sort of, maybe we should do a Green's function in, in, the, sun, in the Boni decomposition by, by regime or by SS, or in SST space. Um, so I, you know, I encourage all of you to think about what are some other ways of looking at this problem that might you know, highlight different physics than, than just this lat lawn space greens functions? And maybe that will get at some of your questions of what happens in different regions. All right, we have one question in the room and then three online after. Spencer Hill, Princeton. This is for Maria, actually. Uh, you mentioned briefly the quantifying the pattern effect, this question of, is everything other than homo the homogeneous warming the pattern effect? Or in essence, essence, what's the reference state? So it reminded me of, in the feedbacks framework, that we know pretty compellingly at this point that it's the relative humidity fixed reference state is the more salient one than the conventional specific humidity fixed one. But it seems much less well posed, this question. So just any thoughts on that question? Yeah, so I think uh, I think the taking the 150 year regression from quadrupling is just a historical accident because this is how we do it. And this is now the reference, but it's very random. If you choose 200 years or doubling of CO2, you get a different number. So the, the you have two moving targets, the reference and whatever period of interest you want to quantify the pattern effect for. This is why I think refer, uh, referencing everything to just the homogeneous SES type feedback might be the, the more logical one, but it would require additional experiments and so on. But then even an SSP scenario would have a pattern effect or the, the uh, abrupt quadrupling would also have a pattern effect. Anything which is not homogeneous would have an effect, but it's just a suggestion. Um, it's also tough in the in, uh, moving to paleo, which we will do tomorrow. What What's the truth? Is the quadrupling the truth? Or is the current state the truth? Or what? Okay. Right, I mean, it's restricting to the CO2 problem for now, not paleo. The, I, I take your point about the CES uniform, but we know in the same way that the specific humidity fix isn't gonna be the we know that the warming isn't going to be uniform. Broadly, there will be polar amplification to some degree, right? And so is the multi-model mean the best reference? I, um, I don't know. Is it, is pick it the out observational the one record? Model. Because whatever wackiness goes on in the observational record, it's at least the real world. Um, 
maybe the reference would be today, but then the question is how peculiar is today? Uh, I think it's totally open. I think we might pick up this discussion, especially for the paleo, but also, we, uh, yeah, uh, I don't know. All right, we have three questions online. So we'll go Diego, Yemi, and then Clara. So Diego, go ahead, we can see you. Hi, uh, I am Diego from the Max Planck Institute. Uh, I had a comment on the teleconnection thing between the tropics and the high latitudes and uh, it seems to me that more than atm an atmospheric uh, uh, teleconnection could be also a teleconnection through the ocean. I mean, uh, uh, maybe with the forcing and with the uptake of heat, the uh, the upwelling, for example, of cold water in the East Pacific changes. Uh, and um, in that way, then probably uh, one should think more on how the uh, I, I mean in creating these uh, these uh, uh, these greens functions, uh, one may think better in what is uh, what is important for the ocean circulation. What are what are the regions where you have upwelling of uh, cold water from the deep ocean and where you have the deep water formation, for example, and in particular. That is true for the Southern Ocean. You have their deep water formation, for example. Then, what are your thoughts about this uh, relationship with the with the uh, circulation, uh, with the ocean circulation in particular? Anyone want to answer that? Does anybody in the audience want to answer that? Can I chip in on that? It's actually. Related. Yes. So it's, I have very similar quest, uh, comment to what Diego just said. Um, in a 2018 paper that I uh, alleged, I showed that the that tropical eastern warming pattern is really due to ocean circulation changes. So it, my comment lies into um, how we can easily misattribute uh, coupled. Uh, SST changes by using standalone ocean simulations or slab ocean simulations. By, by using the slab simulation, ocean heat uptake for uh, a slab simulation to test uh, a coupled problem, it's essentially constraining the ocean response part of it. You're not going to get an ocean response part. So, of course, the tropical SST or OHU response pattern is the most excitable pattern in the climate system. So you can get that response by forcing other places. So I guess my uh, comment has to do with considering the um, experimental setup in attributing these responses. In a coupled system, the answer can easily be different, I think. So by using a, a slab simulation or a fixed SST simulation, we can easily constrain that answer, and we have to consider that, I guess. So here's a few thoughts on that, so unless somebody else wants to take this. Um, so, again, so again, if you're just interested in the atmospheric greens function, it sort of doesn't matter what the, what the ocean does. You only care about the SSTs. Of course, you really, you really want to know how those SSTs get set, so you have to think about the ocean as well. So, so some of the Q flux greens functions can help with that, but those are also slab ocean. Uh, and then for the second part of the answer, Sarah, Sarah has done work on this, and I think there's a couple of posters. Yeah, you've done work on you as you've done work on this. Um, I think we might have a couple of posters, and Sally Zhang and Clara Desser and Sarah Kang and a few other people have Brian Brian Green. Uh, people have looked at some of these teleconnections between the Southern Ocean and the Equatorial Pacific in both slab oceans and coupled models, um, and you do get different responses. So I don't know if any of those people might want to take uh, this question to talk about the teleconnections in a coupled model. To make a short comment on this. So you can see here is a really hierarchy of the model setup. We use fixed SD simulation to study 
atmosphere responds to that certain SSTs. And then we have this QFLOS screen function to study to, to show you the autology connection accounting for surface heat flux or mostly thermocoupling or atmospheric pathway. And then, yeah, indeed, the question, open question is how oceanic pathway uh, of this teleconnection can e eventually influence this teleconnection. Is it uh, amplifying the tropical response to southern ocean heat uptake or is damping the uh, teleconnection uh, or damping the tropical response to southern ocean? Uh, uh, what am I gonna say? Uh, yeah, so we, uh, we have some posters uh, looking at both slab ocean and the fully coupled models using different forcing in the southern ocean, including meltwater, including nudging surface surface temperatures to observe as uh, southern ocean cooling. Um, what else we have uh, today? Uh, have yeah, and uh, uh, also the uh, different forcing, CO2 forcing at high latitude or surface heat flux, but uh, with different cloud response. So all of these are trying to use in full couple models to really investigate oceanic path or at least, or atmospheric pathway in this fully coupled setup, how they're tied together to eventually influence the tropical SD response. But I think that's an open, but very interesting question to uh, further investigate. Yeah, not to plug my own poster too hard, but uh, I, in my poster, um, I ran uh, two large ensembles of coupled climate models, and in one of them, there's no changes to the wind stress-driven ocean circulation, and one there is, and you actually get a different warming rate, uh, a different pattern, as well as a different uh, globally averaged warming rate, which I think really goes to Yemi's point that in a slab model where you don't have changes to the ocean circulation, you're potentially going to get a very different answer than a, in a fully coupled model. Thank you. Uh, hi, can I jump in uh, to make a few comments? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I have, I, so, uh, what we have done is like to use this pattern effect to kind of explain the intermodal spread in color feedback from the simple model because we know there's a large spread uh, in the climate sensitivity from the simple model ensemble. And uh, well, at the heart of the uncertainty is the call feedback, especially a short wave call feedback. And here, what we have done is to look at a set of like 40 CMM6 coupled climate model. And we look at this, like uh, the erupt of four times CO2 simulation. What we found is like, there's a strong correlation between the size of ocean salinity roughly within the region from 45 to 60 degree. Uh, that is that's, that is also the region where the, sub, the water began to subduct, right? Which is, uh, corresponds to the AIW or SAMW, which is the sub um, Antarctica model water region. So the idea what we found is like uh, the model's difference in simulating the salinity in that region dominates the ocean heat uptake there. And uh, one of the most important feature is that will drive a difference in the vertical heating. So for those models with higher salinity there, they will drive a deeper warming, deeper ocean warming. That is a less warming in the surface waters, while more warming in the relatively deep ocean. And uh, this difference in the vertical heating will have a diff make a difference in the surface warming pattern. And uh, and this is not only seen in the local size ocean, but also these surface waters. I think they are advocated to these tropics and the subtropics, especially the southeastern Pacific Ocean. That's also the region with the strongest uh, contribution to the intermodal spread in call feedback, especially the short wave call feedback. Um, so I think that's one of the mechanisms to help us understand the, the sources of the system of temperature pattern where we are talking about. And at the same time, not only the subduction region, there are some people mentioning this deep convection uh, in the South Ocean. Uh, that uh, I think also play a role, but based on our analysis, uh, we found that that's maybe a, like a second row compared to the water subduction um, north of the ACC, which is Antarctica's compolar current. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. You have a poster on that? I don't remember. Yeah, I have a poster uh, this afternoon. I can like introduce more. Yeah. And I want to give Clara a chance to ask her a question. Go ahead, Clara. Thanks. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear and see you. Right. Actually, I had the uh, exact same question as all these previous questions. So I just want to reiterate how important it is not to misconstrue 
these SST forced AMIP runs for greens for the purpose of uh, the greens functions because I think you know if the SSTs in the far western Pacific are really created by the atmosphere and not by the ocean then you know uh, it's not super relevant to look at at the, just the response of the atmosphere to those SSTs so maybe we can uh, think as a group about uh, maybe hearkening to Ben Sanderson's point also about uh, finding sort of these leading patterns of ocean induced SST, uh, low frequency anomalies, and doing a pacemaker kind of setup with our coupled models. And that will then, for the purpose of getting at the greens functions, and maybe that will help to. Uh, find the important ocean induced, induced part of the SST trends that then, you know, impact the, the radiative response. But I really have nothing more to, new to say. I just think this discussion is really important. Thanks. Could you pull up my slides? In response to that, one paper that came to mind is um, John Marshall had a paper at one point where they had a constant, you know, atmospheric feedback and they looked at exactly that, the ocean um, response. And I think it could be kind of fun to do that with more models. That was with the MIT GCM, but, and that was on a hundred year time scale. I think it was the main results, but something similar would help along those lines because it was a constant atmospheric feedback pattern, right? So there was no spatial structure in the atmospheric feedback. Thank you. Yeah, so this kind of harks back to what I was trying to show here is the atmospheric greens functions are just one small part of this of this coupled problem. And I I've, agree with Clara, we should be looking at some of these other components, like, you know, how does the ocean set temperatures? So this is again, in a slab, I think this is in a slab ocean, but this is sort of what Liu et al, I believe, and I don't fully understand their, their methodology, but this is one of the things they do in their Q-flux greens function. So this is a different type of greens function aimed at looking at SST responses. Uh, and that is one of the leading modes of the sea surface temperature response in response to heat fluxes in the slab. I don't fully understand their definition. I don't know if any of them are here, but um, yeah, it seems like there, there are a couple of very recent works that do try to get in that direction. So um, hopefully this will help answer Clara's questions. We also have a couple of talks more on the ocean in the afternoon. So we'll hear more about coupled mechanisms and, and ocean dynamics. Um, yeah, so I think I can speak directly to that a little bit. Um, my poster here shows not only, hmm? oh, sorry, I'm Alison Opiki and I'm from Princeton. I'm a student at Princeton. Um, so, not only is you know the SST and the radiation coupled, but what I show is that actually these surface heat fluxes are related to the atmospheric circulation because of course wind affects evaporation. And so um, thinking about yeah changes in the ocean dynamics and the atmospheric dynamics, and thinking about these patterns that are self consistent within the climate system within the coupled climate system, I think can be relevant. Uh, I actually did have a broader question also. Um, so we saw that the heat uptake efficacy is you know really strong at high latitudes and you hear a lot about southern ocean clouds but then why do the greens functions show that uh the mean radiation doesn't isn't very sensitive to the southern ocean right is very weak colors down there the uh, gr uh ssc greens function right uh yeah as i said in, uh, the yeah, in the Lean et al. 2021 paper, they eventually find that the strong clouds are first seeing the SSTs in the tropic, and these SSTs are driven by the ocean heat uptake. So it looks like this high latitude ocean heat uptake pattern effect comes about through not local SSD changes, but changing the tropical SSD and further influence that uh, cost there. So that's why you, uh, if you only run the fixed SSD simulation, they probably didn't account for this tile connection through the uh, uh, heat uptake influence but uh and then if you run 
two fold screen function accounting for this tidal connection, it shows a big impact on the tropical uh, clouds, but through changing tropical SSDs. Does it, does it make sense? Oh, that makes sense. And I just want to add some notes on in couple models that um, I believe Professor Sarah can give me more information about. Um, Sarah and Yanting are doing something called ETHMIP that they force um, couple models with warming or cooling, and they see the warming or cooling anomaly in Southern Ocean that will lead to a remote impact on the tropical SST. So at least we see that um, see that um, features. But what what's the actual what's the exact process? So I think it's still on an ongoing work. Is that the change of the circulation of the that dominates the temperature um, heat? Sorry, heat transport, or is that the main circulation that carries the warming anomaly that matters? I think this is still an ongoing work. I think <laughs> Professor. Sarah can give me more information and 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 but in the Q flux settings, we are carry um, we are just um, thinking about the surface process that the um, temperature can be modified by the um, wind and that wind could be driven by atmospheric process. So it's um, we are not looking at the change of the ocean, but we are looking at the, the surface process that can be modified by the um, atmospheric process. So I don't know if that adds a little bit more. Thanks. Thanks. I think we will close the discussion for now. There's tons of time to keep moving on with this. We do a little icebreaker game now, including online and in-person people. So stay where you are and pull out your smartphone. Okay, here we go. So everybody, <clears throat> go to kahoot.it or take the QR code up there. It might be a little far away. It's like K-A-H-O-O-T and then dot .it. Great, and then you have to put in the number <clears throat> and choose a name. Ooh, great. If you're very quiet, you hear funny music, but it doesn't matter so much. So the, the way this will work is that I put a question on the screen and you have 30 seconds to answer it. So don't think too much and decide. And there will be four, four options for each question. There are points to gain, so you better choose the correct answer. We had to choose the correct answer, so correct is what Christian and I think is correct. Great. We have 70 people putting for a few more. Thanks, great idea. Everybody in the room is on? Great, let's start. Okay, get ready.
So this is the time running. 20 seconds left. Not bad. Whoever that is, you climb on. It's better to pick something than nothing. I guess this is self-selection bias. <laughs> Whoa, okay, we have a lot to do tomorrow. Uh, uh. Two more. Hey, these are pretty clear distributions. Jonah, go, one last. Great, wonderful. Okay, we have to work on these guys here. But this is what we're here for. Let's see the final outcome. Okay, so how this will actually evolve into an icebreaker is that now you look for two people you've never met, never talked to, and discuss these questions. <laughs> 